All right, so Keith, let's start. Um, you served four years uh, in uh, the Vermont legislature. And if when the average person thinks of Vermont, they would think, oh, liberal, progressive, that's where Bernie Sanders is from. Um, but, but walk folks through having to deal with uh, a white supremacist harassing you that forced you to say, I got to get out of politics. There was a whole confluence of really kind of mind-boggling circumstances that really led to that moment where I said, I need to make this decision for the safety of my family. Um, one of them being, you know, I mean, Vermont loves its small charm and its bucolic kind of image. And so we literally don't even have security at the state house other than some armed police officers that are sort of wandering the building. There's no security checks that anyone has to go through. And um, it had been wow, a that's year. Rare. It's incredibly rare. You can't even go into many high schools without going through a, a, a battery of identifications mm -hmm. and um, ways to prove that you're, you're supposed to be in the building. Now, we want it to be the people's space, but then this is where the public and the private come into play in a really dangerous way. So as a black woman, I had been experiencing a number of different, you know, kind of points in time that sort of racialized who I was and how I how I was situated within our state government and as well within the state itself. And so, so as... the only African-American in the legislature at the time? The only African-American woman. Got it, okay. Yes, the only African-American woman. Our People of Co Color Caucus men? was all of three people. So three people. <laughs> and and that's, that's black, Latino, is everybody. Or they're that's, just black. That's all we had in the House and there was two in the Senate. Okay, got it. Out of 180 members. Got it. And that's it. <laughs> and, and so, that's it. And so, so, so what was it? Was it was it phone calls? Was it letters? People accosting you at public events? What was it? So um, it had been growing in um, a number of different ways, receiving really dangerous emails from different people who are associated with di different white nationalist groups. Also finding ourselves in this um, situation where I had one particular individual who had been put onto me as a, a, a public figure. This is someone who was an actual constituent of mine within my district. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the larger websites like Daily Stormer said, are you aware that she's even elected to, how, how did this happen mm -hmm. in your community? And that's what began this really insidious um, stalking that had happened with how this long? individual. Over, over how long period? So this was over two years. So it was um, chilling enough that I was able to get a, an order of protection through the courts. Um, and once that order of protection ran out, and this is again where we start to see how our criminal justice systems are beyond flawed, that they're antiquated and how to deal with this new world order of white supremacy and white nationalism and the way that it's really impacting our everyday lives, um, that once that order ended, that individual picked right back up where they left off. But meanwhile, I'm over here dealing with a billion other daggers that are coming my direction because we had... Um, as the only person of color that was sitting on our um, judicial committee in the House Judiciary, we were tasked with having to pass a number of laws, put forth legislation around gun reform. Mm -hmm. And that brought an entire extra layer of danger for pretty much everything that we were doing just for us to do our jobs. So what was the response from your fellow members? So the response was shock, it was concern, but it was there was much of uh, confusion. This, again, understanding that as the second whitest state in the union, we're completely unrehearsed at how to deal with issues of this nature. How yeah, do you but, but, think but is, about what racism even looks and feels like on a day-to-day -day lived experience? Okay, it, remove race. They understand what stalking is. Yes. Okay, they understand what threatening of violence is. Yes. So this ain't hard. It's not, except that um, there is this... Uh, the, the passionate conversations around protecting our constitutional rights around First Amendment really come together in a dangerous way when it comes to public figures, and especially those that are in elected office. So there really was this sense of, well, there's not a whole lot we can do. Because you're an elected figure, therefore, anything essentially anyone says to you is protected as free speech. Okay, saying something to you is different than somebody who is stalking you. I mean, were you getting actual threats? Threats on your life, threats on your family's life. Mm -hmm. That ain't so, First Amendment. That's those are threats. So, and we also, again, looking at our antiquated standards, 
we have this really high bar for how to prove true threat, what they call true threat. So really there's not much beyond them actually taking physical action to harm you up until a point where our state had a mechanism for dealing with it. And I found that completely unacceptable. But this is, this is I know it feels like it's a, this could happen any one type of story, but there is a greater gravity when we think about what this means. Them not un- being able to understand the terror that I was enduring and that many people of color throughout the state had been enduring um, with regards to these just really violent and dangerous racial um, experiences, it requires for us to show that we're bleeding in order for anyone to take action. It requires a, a ridiculous burden of proof as far as how harmful all of this is and what it really does to our everyday lives. Sort of reminds me of uh, what women face when they get protective orders against men who are stalking them. And the cops say, well, there's nothing we can do until they do something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I forgot, I remember, remember there was, was an actress, I can't remember her name, uh, who was shot and killed. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those things where, well, you know, until someone does something, we can't do anything. And you're going, okay, so I need to get shot, need to get stabbed, need to get run over before you go, okay, now we can do something. But, but it's rare to hear state legislators mm-hmm. saying that, mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to, no, if you are threatening a public official, typically that's considered a higher standard. Yeah. And so that's why I'm not understanding I know. This, uh, this ambivalence or sort of, well, there's nothing we really can do. Well, so that is the real, that is the part that I think hurts the most for everyone as we're really dealing with this, grappling with my whole story. If I, as one of the most powerful people of color in the entire state, a rising star in our state legislature, who was well respected and well known, could not get the basic protections that I needed in this new landscape of a new way of terrorizing black and brown and minority populations, what hope does anyone else have for the average person on the street? do, Do you believe that the white Vermont legislators, your colleagues, they fail you in black people and people of color in Vermont. They did. And what's interesting about this is I say this not as harshly as an indictment because what did happen when I made the stand to say this is not an acceptable way of functioning, that these are not acceptable parameters for you to ask anyone to work under, especially those that choose to serve the state, um, that those were their own words. They could see how that fear of, well, will there be repercussions? Are people going to say that we're making it a bigger deal than it is? Does that mean that we have to then admit that there is racism within our state that is so progressive? Are these the things that we now have to face and deal with? And that, there's a terror behind that, but it's a false terror because it's not anywhere on the scale of the emotional and historical and generational trauma that marginalized people are dealing with every day. Where was the governor? Where were Senator Sanders? Where were the other states, the other U.S. senator, members of Congress? I mean, were they weighing in and saying to Vermont, this is fundamentally wrong, fix this? They came out, so I will say that they reached out um, in different variable intervals. Um, The governor did call me personally because he won, He wanted to try to see if I could convince me to stay in office. And really, again, realizing that there was gonna be no real sense of safety for me, um, seeing that the system is incapable of keeping me safe in the ways that I needed to be safe in order for me to be the vocal mm-hmm. and visible type of um, leader that I wanted to be able to be. The governor's response was, well, but then if you quit, then they win which is garbage. It's something that I reject wholeheartedly. Yeah, but if I stay, I might get killed. It's not... With no protection. I don't feel a need. I don't (laughs) feel that anyone should be asked to martyr themselves in order to bring about our liberation because we are at a place where we don't have the luxury of time to be able to say that we have to fall down on the sword in order for us to rise. We have to say no more. Well, it's it's sort of like for me... um, the issue that I have with Nikki Haley in South Carolina. Mm. I don't give Nikki Haley credit in South Carolina mm-hmm. for the Confederate flag coming down. Mm-hmm. Because it took nine black people mm-hmm. 
including the state legislator, mm -hmm. to be gunned down in a church yes. for that to happen. Yes. So my deal is, you don't, you don't, you, you don't get credit. They get credit yeah. because it was their deaths that caused it to happen. And I think when you look at the history of black people, mm -hmm. again, I was, I was speaking somewhere and we, we were talking about the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Mm -hmm. I said, folks, let me remind y'all, that bill was filibustered. Mm -hmm. King had to get assassinated mm -hmm. for Congress to pass it. Mm -hmm. And so we could go down the line where black blood had to be shed Absolutely. for the right thing to be done, as Absolutely. opposed to simply saying, do the right thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that is, that's a fundamental difference that I feel in how we are supposed to be able to change our laws and change the way that our society functions. Um, I agree with you completely on that, and I see that when we want to talk about the Fair Housing Act. My own family had the benefits of um, being able to get housing support through the control program and the lawsuit that took place for that, going against the Chicago Public Housing Association that created our Section 8 systems and things like that that we have now. It's been a 50-year battle right. to settle that. That just got settled in 2019. 50 years. I believe that they actually were hoping that the lead attorney would have passed away before they would actually have to finally settle in doing the right thing, before it would actually be a point where we could say, okay, we're going to actually do the right thing now, because we are very clear about it. Part of this that's really painful again, and I keep using these words like painful, is when I think about this long arc of history, we want to talk about MLK, and we want to talk about how it's this process that we move slowly towards finding justice. Justice has never hit us on a slow pace. There was never a 10-year plan into slavery where we had many community discussions to decide how we would become oppressed. There were no... There was no long-term strategies on what that was going to look like for folks to be segregated or for people to be put on the trail of tears or for Japanese internment camps to go into play. Those things happened very quickly. And so this fear of being able to make the radical changes that are necessary in order to keep my experience from being that of others and to be able to help those who don't have a platform, who do not have power, and cannot get the, their governor on their cell phone, then what are we doing right now? If we cannot move that forward and do so in a meaningful and a radical way, then we're going to continue to bump up against the biggest fears that people have. You talk about the second whitest state in the union. Yes. Um, and what you're describing is one of the reasons why black folks are not trying to live in places where there are few of us. Because uh, I can think back, uh, my brother working for DuPont, and here he is in northern Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And he's driving on roads, and he's dealing with, you know, white farmers mm -hmm. uh, when, he had to go, when he had to go work in Iowa as well. Uh, when, you, when you hear the experiences of other African Americans in those places, there are few of us, yeah. and people don't understand what that isolation is like. Mm. Uh, for you, are you from there? I'm not. I'm from Chicago originally. Oh hell yeah! So you, uh, yeah, so 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 you, so you, from Chicago, and you got to Vermont when? I got, well, a little over ten years ago. Okay, so, mm -hmm. that, so again, that had to be complete, going from the second highest concentration of black people mm -hmm. in the country outside of New York City, to Vermont. Yes, and here is where things have changed, though. So. The demographics in Vermont have changed dramatically. So? The number of people of color have grown exponentially. I look forward to our next round of um, our next round of uh, census. census because it will show that there has been significant growth. And here is the thing: is that people go to Vermont for all the same reasons. You want to be able to have the beauty. You want to have access to nature. You're looking for a quieter pace of life. You want to be able to have chickens in your backyard if that's your thing. Those are the reasons why people look for the opportunities to live somewhere different and have a very different experience. But that weight and that gravity that comes with having um, working within a system that is not used to dealing with issues of race and discrimination, dealing with inequities, um, and fixing them tangibly, that puts an enormous burden on those that are there. Now, what I can say is what has happened since Mm -hmm. I came forth with this since this whole motion has happened. It has been a significant amount of work. It is not without its faults. Mm -hmm. And those are where, as people of color in the state, we're coming together. So for, for this moment in time, we have 
a massive collective of leaders of color, and not just black and brown. We have our tribal chiefs, we have our Palestinian activists, we have our Asian American communities, we have our LGBTQIA. We have so many different folks that are coming together in solidarity and saying, okay, so thank you for wanting to rush forth and find solutions, but they need to be the right ones. And it should not be done in our name without us being at the table, which is precisely what has brought us to this moment. How do you extrapolate what you have had to endure in Vermont with the rest of the country. Do you believe that them, those white legislators not getting it is what we see happening here in DC? But you have people who are coming from places and they don't see many of us and they literally, I, I, I'm not understanding what you guys have to go through. Mm -hmm. Not understanding the reality of black dealing with police on a daily basis, mm -hmm. not understanding mm -hmm. being black walking through a grocery store. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we run on this show here, we have all these videos, we call crazy, crazy ass white women and crazy ass white men. I mean, you got white folks who are, you know, calling the cops on black people for mm -hmm. barbecuing, mm -hmm. uh, for the, the white woman in Houston who decides to push this black couple for taking pictures on a sidewalk mm -hmm. when she should have stayed in her car minding her own business. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just story after story, and and you and you sort of have this this notion of you got white folks who are saying this is ours, mm -hmm. this is ours, mm -hmm. and y'all need to understand this is ours. Mm -hmm. I think Vermont reflects both the United States. It both reflects the problems of the United States and the promise because it is so small. It has the opportunity to get it right, but it also has to be checked in order so that we don't get it wrong and grossly wrong. Um, the, those issues of racism are absolutely there. I mean, Vermont has the second highest rates of black males incarcerated in the United States. Second highest rate of black males incarcerated in the U.S.? Yes. Wow. Um, we have, just in my community alone, research has shown that our police department profiles racially profiles at a rate higher than that of Chicago. Wow. And so the ways that this either can move us towards change, or as you're saying, have people allow for them to set down their stakes and dig in their heels, is that we see what's happening right now is there's a, well that data's wrong and that methodology must be clearly incorrect and there's no way that that's really what's happening here. Is it as bad as it seems? Is it really that disparate? And so they, you know, we have our chiefs of police coming forth and saying, we want new research now. We want to use this group. The, so the same police department that was found to have these gross, gross inequities around race that is being sued by the American Civil Liberties Union for racial discrimination puts out a secondary report just after the press conference announcing that they're not going to be taking any actions mm -hmm, with regards mm -hmm, to my mm -hmm. case to say, we found nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong at this exact same police department. That data, those accounts, all of that anecdotal, it's just wrong. Clearly, that's not how it is. We have our leaders, we have our senators, our state senators and our town leaders coming forth and saying, we're really not racist. Maybe this will just blow over. <laughs> there are a few bad people, but there is no systemic racism. There is no systemic discrimination, and there's no work to be really done. This was just an isolated incident. So that is the way that we, that is the way that we gaslight our own experiences, and that is the way that we shut down the ability to really critically analyze, to own our messiness, and to get it right. A couple more questions. Um, I I'm working on a book called white fear. Mm -hmm. And what I contend is that what we are dealing with right now literally are white folks in America who are absolutely scared to death of 2043. They cannot handle the idea mm -hmm. of this nation being majority people of color. Mm -hmm. When you look at the number of fewer black law partners today than a decade ago. Mm -hmm. When you look at what's happening in media, I'm, in, I'm a VP of NABJ, we're calling out CNN, no black executives. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at what is happening, uh, when you look at what Trump and the buttons he's pushing, that, that we are dealing literally with folks who are saying, okay, this thing is now real. Yeah. Black Latinos, yeah. Asian Native Americans, 
they, their numbers are growing and it's fear and it's not crosses burning and wearing mm -hmm. hoods. Mm -hmm. It's under, it, it's, it's, it's those, those, those subtle things mm -hmm. where our way of life, mm -hmm. which really means the white way of life, mm -hmm. has to now, regardless of how we feel, we now have to listen to you. And your value system, being black, mm -hmm. is different from mine. And now, I now have to now reframe yeah. my view of America, yes. reframe yes. my understanding of history, yes. reframe yes. my view of systemic institutional racism. Yes, because now, and that's why, that's why I believe mm -hmm. the attacks against Ilhan Omar, mm -hmm. because she's Muslim. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. Okay, we only had two. We had Keith Ellison and Andre Carson. Now we got three, two women and Carson. And then uh, Ocasio-Cortez, same thing. Well, 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 hold on. Who, who is this brash uh, Latina woman coming here? I just fundamentally believe that we are in this period of white fear, mm -hmm. and they don't even recognize it. They're articulating it, but they can't even own up to it. Absolutely. And there is, I mean, I saw that happen within my own case. And this is where I talked about how these movements were able to gain footing, even within the state. It's not that they're walking into a place where it says, oh, there's a swastika. Let me go up there and hang up with those neo-Nazis. I feel like I need to go join the Ku Klux Klan today. That's not how people are connecting up with these ideologies. It starts as, wow, they're coming to take our guns, to don't you hate the fact that those Mexicans are taking all our jobs, to, oh, so now we're going to do ethnic studies in school? Or are you going to start calling all of our kids racist? And it bubbles and grows mm -hmm. into this really softball acceptance of really dangerous ideologies. Mm -hmm. And it feeds on that exact fear. It feeds on that exact concern. Because those are their words. That right. is what they are saying. We are going to be the minority if we are not already. And so where is the racism to, to block what's happening right. to white cisgendered heterosexual males? It's an insane, bizarro world, but it is one that is effective. When the white supremacist Richard Spencer, when he uh, spoke at Texas A&M University, and the university wanted to oppose it, they asked me to come down, I'm a graduate of Texas A&M, um, and the room where he was speaking, it, it was filled to capacity, so it was blocked off. DPS troops, everything blocked it off. So there's a white guy there in khaki pants, mm -hmm. the bomber jacket. Mm -hmm. you, you just, again, not not a buzz cut, he's not wearing fatigues or whatever. And, I, and so I'm standing next to him and he, he's, he goes, well, you know, he said, yeah, well, I'm gonna, I can't hear what he says because he has some interesting thoughts. And I said, really? Mm -hmm. So the guy starts telling me, you know, he served 20, like 20 plus years in the Air Force and he starts telling me this story about, you know, something with flying or whatever and then somebody black who he felt was unqualified and shouldn't have been in that position. So he, he's going on and on and on. I'm listening and I said, you do know that there are white folks who've gotten opportunities who have no business being in there. And he said, look, I said, yes, I can show you a plethora, I can give you a plethora of those stories. But for him, regular white guy, mm -hmm. again, no, no, no swastikas, uh, no tattoos, but when he said he has some interesting thoughts, he was identifying with the views of a white supremacist. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I saw so that you, you take those legislators, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that they are white supremacists, but the fact that they ch could not even process mm -hmm. what you were going through, and then this idea of, <laughs> we, we won't have time for that, that speaks to the fundamental problem because that's them saying, out of sight, out of mind, it's not our, it's not our life, not our concern, we're gonna go back to our whiteness, Mm -hmm. And you and your family, y'all can deal with that. Mm -hmm. The biggest challenge, I think, of what we're facing right now and what Vermont is facing, Vermont is working. I, I do want to give them credit. They, we're not giving out cookies today, but I do want to at least acknowledge that people are trying actively to really engage on a more grassroots level, mm -hmm. trying to have community dialogues. Let's do our book readings. Let's have people walk through what unpacking white supremacy and white privilege and what that means. And people are trying to step forward. It's not everyone, as we know it won't be. Right. But... Here's the thing is that I don't want us to get to a point where we arrive at, now we've fixed this. Right. So, okay, we've, Kai's gotten her reparations that she needs, so now we're done. 
because that leaves mm -hmm. everyone else behind. Right. Um, so the issues that Vermont is facing are the same ones that we're facing in LA, all of our other states. But um, I think Vermont has an opportunity to show where it can go and how it can grow and potentially how you can fix it because it is so small mm -hmm. that those impacts will be widely felt. Um, but the biggest thing and the most important thing is that they have to listen to people of color when we are telling you what we need in order to reach our liberation, in order for us to be made whole. From but also, happens. they have to also, this is my biggest thing, they also have to be honest yes. about yes. how they feel. Yes. And I believe we have to give space to that level of honesty mm -hmm. because if they never, ever come to the understanding of damn, did I just say that? Or this is what I think? Then you can't have that dialogue. It's not letting them off the hook, but I think it's forcing people to have to go, and if I take the example, same thing, if you're dealing with a man and a woman and you're dealing with domestic abuse, you have to come to that conclusion of, mm -hmm. this is my stuff. And I think that's also part of the deal. They've never had to confront their stuff. Well, and that, that Never. label of racism is one that is so visceral, it is so visceral mm -hmm. for the person that is receiving it that it makes it almost impossible sometimes to break right. through. But we look at what happened with Northam and everybody's like, well, but that was in the past. But so did his apology actually mean anything as far as him moving forward and showing that he's done the work? I would posit that it hasn't. And um, we've seen that and we have examples of that. I have a legislator, that a former legislator that showed up to a party in blackface that I was at and that person apologized and gave me many heartfelt sorries and so you know I'm terrified by what I did all of these things no sooner it's now been what just a few years later that very same person is on those same message boards talking about how I've just been a race baiter the whole time and I've just been coming here came from Chicago to ruin the state of Vermont so did that person do the work there you go are we there allowing that are we allowing for an a place of rest when the work is so deep and requires a constant vigilance. So um, that is what I am most keeping my eyes out for and that I'm hoping that others are, that we don't find this pinpoint where we can say, and we've done that work, because I don't believe that on an individual or a systemic level that we are anywhere near there. So I have to ask you this, because in being, being from Vermont, so I had a conversation with Senator Sanders specifically on his constant attacks on identity politics. And I literally said, you need to understand that you are using the language of folks mm -hmm. who have opposed mm -hmm. black liberation from the mm -hmm. 60s. Mm -hmm. So I said, so when you talk about identity politics, and I mean, I, literally, I, was, I mean, we went to his office, I was like straight up. And I said, we're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. I said, because the phrase identity politics didn't even come out until black folks started fighting for their rights in the 60s. And then it was women in Title IX. And then uh, it was the disabled. And then it was folks who are Latino and who are LGBT. And all of a sudden, black folks started that whole movement. Mm -hmm. black, every, all, all those groups have been using the black playbook. Mm -hmm. and, so, and my point was, you need to understand when you keep slamming that, you're actually speaking from your position of whiteness. Yes. And I said, it's a problem. Yeah. Just like when you're talking about white working class. Oh, excuse me, working class. I said, you need to understand, black people are not hearing ourselves. And Jeff Weaver uh, made a point. He said, when Congresswoman Marsha Fudge pulled his coattail, he said, now when he says working class, he, he says, and I mean black, Latino, white. I said, so... And it was a very interesting thing, and which which is why he 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 is having to deal with mm -hmm. this whole piece where you're now running not in Vermont but the rest of the country. And this Just is something, thought, your, your this is something that? that all of our congressmen are are struggling with. I would say the entire Vermont delegation is struggling with in many ways, but it is definitely something that we've had particular criticisms around Senator Sanders for. Now, Senator Sanders has been someone that I've considered a friend. Um, we worked on many projects together, um, but was very disappointed um, very recently um, by the Sanders Institute and their decisions to not engage the very communities of color that on whom's back Vermont got its progressive 
reputation from, who have been on the front lines fighting for all of this. So as we're saying, we want to create this new global vision. It doesn't include the people who actually did the labor to make that happen. And there was this complete just sort of obfuscation that happened around all of that and never a resolution. And to this day, we still have not gotten a phone call from anyone at the Sanders Institute, even though we came with this very large open letter of many, many leaders of color saying, we'd like to meet with you. Because again, as you were trying to set the agenda for the rest of the world and for this nation, we feel that we need to have a conversation first mm. about what's happening even here in Vermont, which is absolutely reflective of what's happening in the rest of the country. And that has not happened. And um, it is this hands-off very much between Washington and what happens within the states. Well, we try not to get involved in state politics. However, however, it is these voices that are needed in some ways the most because we are the most oppressed and the most suppressed as far as being able to utilize our vocal power and our historical memories. So um, it's something that I hope that there will be an opportunity to work with all of the political candidates, but especially Senator Sanders as he's looking for this presidential bid. Because it is not that people are oppositional to him. It is that we cannot have an administration that doesn't even acknowledge or cannot hear from the very people who have placed them in that seat of power in a meaningful way. So you've resigned. What are you doing now? I am the director of a statewide coalition that is pushing ethnic and social equity in all of our schools, K through 12. And um, it's a beautiful coalition, again, of some of the most incredible leaders. Um, I'm working on a book right now and a documentary actually about race relations in Vermont. Well, that sounds uh, great. Uh, I certainly think that um, this, the fact that you have had to endure this in a state like Vermont, with all of the progressive labels, is what I constantly speak to this whole issue of the notion of whiteness, mm -hmm. the notion of white privilege, mm -hmm. and the notion of white supremacy is not a thing that's on the right. Mm -hmm. That whether you're on the left, the right, whether it's a D or R, the operative word mm -hmm. is whiteness. Mm -hmm. And you have to deal with that mm -hmm. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of folks, no, no, but, but, I'm, but I'm liberal. No, no, y'all got issues too. Yeah. And it might be, not, it may be different than somebody who's conservative, but it's still whiteness. Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks Thank so you. very much. Thank you. All right. It's been a pleasure. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play. You want to support Roller Martin Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. As Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. <laughs>